worked. And then this, <laughs> I don't know. Let's see what happens. So um, guys, this is the topic for your notes today, nuclear chemistry. I think you're gonna like this stuff, it's fascinating. Pretty good stuff. So guys, let me explain to you what we're gonna do today. Obviously, we're gonna talk about nuclear chemistry. The date today is the 10th, 1010. I don't know if there's anything special about that, but guys, today is the 10th and here's how today is going to roll out. What we're going to do is we're going to start by reviewing the stuff that you learned uh, in the homework and we'll give you some, some stuff about that, the important stuff, the stuff you need to know. Then guys, after that, we're going to start talking about nuclear chemistry. We're going to go back and talk about what's going on inside of stars. We're going to talk about what's going on inside um, many of the nuclear weapons that we've uh, built and even dropped. Um, and then we're going to talk about what's going on inside these uh, chunks of uranium that are actually wildly radioactive and spitting uh, subatomic particles all over us as we speak. So, guys, that's going to be sort of the layout for today. A little bit of review talk about what's going on in the sun and nuclear weapons, talk about what's going on in uranium and other radioactive substances, and that'll be our day. So guys, in order to get started, this is what you need to do first. Draw this picture. Um, but let me give you some more guidance. It should be as wide as your page. These circles should be about an inch and a half across. And then when, and then guys, you wanna leave like th uh, three lines up here and then four lines in here. So this will be three lines, this will be four lines. And guys, the hope is that as you're drawing this, you're having that experience where you go, wait, I drew these before. Because you drew these before in your homework. Right? the homework that we graded on completion just a second ago, these are the atomic models that Dalton and Thompson and Rutherford and Bohr and Schrodinger proposed as they came up with their models for the atom. I'm a little disappointed that Nate's already doing the last one because typically everybody gets to the last one at the same time and then everyone's tapping on their tables. And it sounds like that thing that you do at summer camp where you, have you guys ever done that? Where you make the rain sounds, where you like snap your fingers and then rub your, and, 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 and. it's lovely. Jake, a little too comfortable. Guys, while <laughs> all right, everyone do it. Dun 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 dun. You guys understand what all those dun 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 duns represent, right? No, it's not electrons. Yeah, it's actually the probability distribution of finding one electron in three-dimensional space around the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. We'll talk about that in the next unit. Because you do all, of course, understand that electrons actually don't exist until you look for them. We'll talk later. <laughs> actually, that's what the entire next unit is about. You're going to love it. Unless you hate it. <clears throat> all right, so guys, you've got one more minute to finish your drawings, and then we're going to fill this thing in. Heavens. All right, you guys ready to go? Let's do this. So guys, here's what you need to know. Each one of these representations of an atom obviously builds on the other. So guys, follow along. The original thought about an atom is just that it's a solid, unchanging orb. 
Then we realize they're made of things, protons and electrons. Then we realize those positive things don't just float around, they hang out in the middle. Then we found out that those negative things, the electrons, don't just float around, they organize themselves into rings. Then we figured out it's actually not rings, it's actually more like clouds. And these things all build on each other. So here's what you need to know. For these four or five models, you need to know who came up with them, what experiment they did, what this model represents the discovery of, and then the name of the model. So guys, we are going to, synth we're gonna, we're gonna distill, if you will, your class notes. So guys, this, like early, you don't need to know dates, but early 1800s, like 1805, a dude named John Dalton, by studying gases, figured out that atoms are these small, permanent objects. You may remember from your notes that he proposed the law of definite proportions and contributed to the law of conservation of mass, which is familiar to us. But guys, when they asked John Dalton, what is an atom like? He said, atoms are like pool balls. If you've ever played pool, rack them up, break the rack, put them in the pockets. He guys, he said, Dalton, what's an atom like? He said, it's like a pool ball. But Dalton was a Brit, and in Britain, they don't call it pool, they call it billiards. So this is what is called the billiard ball model of the atom, because Dalton thought atoms were like pool balls, these small, dense, hard, permanent spheres. You guys good on that? Okay, so then guys, fast forward 90 years, and along comes a dude named J.J. Thompson. And guys, J.J. Thompson actually experimented with what are called cathode ray tubes. We'll talk more about what that looks like in a minute, but guys, this is one of the research projects you do need to know. So you may want to circle cathode ray tube because this is one of them you got it. that we're going to talk about it more. This one you do need to know well. So J.J. Thompson cathode ray tube discovered the electron. So guys, Thompson was smart and he figured if there's, pos if there's negative electrons, there's also got to be something positive because the atom themselves don't have charges. So he not only discovered the electron, he proposed that there were protons. And he didn't call them protons, just something positive. So when they asked Thompson to describe what an atom looked like, he said it looks like pudding, that it's a ball of pudding and that pudding is all positively charged and stuck in the positive pudding are these negative things that he called electrons. And so, because again, Thompson was British, apparently they like eating pudding with plums in it. So this is called the plum pudding model where the pudding is the positive stuff and then the electrons are the plums stuck in the pudding. You guys good? Okay, so guys, how did a cathode ray tube work? And it actually looks like this. You've already got this in your notes. But guys, here's what you need to know. So during Thompson's day, um, they thought the smallest thing on Earth was a hydrogen atom. They thought hydrogen atoms were as small as they get, and it can't get smaller. Then what happened is Thompson took a battery. Um, Nicholas Volta and others had already developed batteries, and we knew that batteries were made of atoms. I mean, everything's made of atoms. And so what he did is he took this battery and he hooked up the positive and negative ends of it to a vacuum tube that had a screen in it that would glow um, when things with charges went across it. And what they found is that when he hooked on the battery and turned out the lights, he would see this beam streaming from one side to the other side of, of the tube. So he said, huh, that's interesting. So then what he did is he took a magnet and he stuck a magnet over here and it turns out the magnet made the beam bend. Well, if the beam is bending in a magnetic field, what does that tell you about the beam? 
It's got a charge. And because the beam bent away, he was able to determine that this thing had a negative charge. Then what he did, by measuring how much the beam bent, he was able to figure out the mass of the things that made up the beam. And it turns out that it was thousands of times lighter than hydrogen. So now Thompson's thinking, huh, there is something smaller than hydrogen. And this thing that's smaller than hydrogen is a couple thousand times smaller than hydrogen, and it's got a negative charge. So he said, this must be a part of an atom, and he called it the electron. You get the idea? So guys, that's how he discovered electrons. Questions on that? Okay, so now let's go back to our picture. So that was like late 1890s. And now we've got electrons. So then, guys, along comes a dude named Robert Millikan. He did his oil drop experiment. And by doing that, he figured out the charge of an electron. Now, guys, understand he didn't change our atomic model. He just refined it by telling us um, what the charge of an electron is. We knew it was negative. He gave it a number. And guys, if any of you ever go to Chicago, go to the University of Chicago. Millikan actually got a Nobel Prize for this work, and his lab is still set up. It's in a building underneath the University of Chicago football stadium, and it's still there. Um, it's like crazy. You can also see YouTube videos of people walking through it. It's really fascinating. But guys, understand Millikan didn't change our model of the atom. He got a Nobel Prize, but he didn't change our model of the atom. He simply refined Thompson's model by measuring the charge of an electron. You guys good? Okay. So then guys, along comes Ernest Rutherford. We're back in England now. And Rutherford did a thing called the gold foil experiment. What he did is he shot radioactive particles at a sheet of gold. Guys, this is also an experiment you need to know, so you may want to circle it. He shot electrons at a sheet of gold. And by doing that, he discovered the nucleus. So he gave us the nuclear model of the atom. Yeah, go ahead, Jared. That, so if you ask Millikan to draw an atom, he would actually draw this one. We don't attribute that to him, but Millikan hadn't interacted with Rutherford, so Millikan still thought Thompson was right. Although, actually, Millikan and Rutherford were alive at about the same time, so later Millikan learned of Rutherford's work and understood there was a nucleus. But Millikan doesn't get his own model. That's a good question. You guys caught up? Okay, so guys, gold foil experiment. Obviously, don't try to draw this. Um, it's already in your notes, or it should be. But guys, this is the way that this worked. So what, what uh, Rutherford did is he took a piece of gold. Literally, it was like aluminum foil, only it was made of gold. And he shot alpha particles, which are subatomic particles. They're actually streaming out of this chunk of uranium right now. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But guys, these things are throwing alpha particles throughout the room like thousands a second, and you can't even see them. But what he did is he shot these alpha particles at a piece of gold, and then he surrounded that piece of gold in a piece of film that would glow when alpha particles hit it. And then he shut out the lights and sat there for days watching these little blips of light show up on the screen. And what he found is that most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold as if nothing was there. But then what he found was that some of these particles, not many, like one in 8,000, would actually bounce back and the screen would glow there. And then every now and then you'd get one that would bend at a weird angle. And guys, based on that data, he actually found three things about atoms. So guys, first of all, what does it mean that most of the particles go straight through? What does that tell you about atoms? They're mostly empty space. 
Guys, the reason that those alpha particles went straight through is because there's basically nothing inside of an atom. Remember, if the nucleus is the size of a marble, then the atom's the size of a football stadium and there's nothing in between. Most of them went straight through. But guys, what does it mean that some of them bounced back? What had to happen in order for this thing to bounce back? It had to hit something. And the something that it hit um, Rutherford later said was the nucleus and he knew it was massive because when these things hit and bounce back they must have hit something heavy so he discovered the nucleus but guys what does it mean that some of these things bent well alpha particles have a positive charge so what does that tell you about the nucleus if the nucleus can make alpha particles bend it's also positively charged because what do like charges do they repel. And so if this alpha particle is coming through and it bends, it means that the nucleus is also positive. So guys, those are the three things that Rutherford discovered. Atoms are mostly space, the nucleus is small and dense, and it's positively charged. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys, we've got two more to go. So now we're back here with the nuclear model of the atom, and then along comes a guy named Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr studied light. We'll talk more about that in the next unit. And as he was studying light, he learned that these electrons are not just mucked into an atom, they're organized. They're organized into orbits. And he called this the planetary model. He thought that atoms were like little solar systems. And then, guys, rounding this out, tipping our hat to Erwin Schrodinger. Schrodinger took the work of Bohr and went deeper, but he didn't do any experiments. Schrodinger was actually one of the first computational chemists. He didn't work in a lab. He worked with pencil and paper doing math. And he was actually able to show that these electrons, in fact, don't circle around the nucleus like planets. Instead, they behave as waves or clouds. And he started a field of study called wave mechanics. And we call his model the charge cloud model of the atom. So guys, these last two we've kind of hurried through a little bit. But basically, this is what we're going to do the whole next unit. So after the test that we take right after fall break, um, this is basically the outline for the next unit is to understand Bohr and Schrodinger's models. Um, so we're not going to get into them a ton right now because it's not critical. Go ahead. That's a good question. So like in biology and other places, why do we still use Bohr's model if we know that it's not perfect, if, if it's not correct. Um, and the reason is because it's good enough. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a principle in science that says when you're modeling something, make your model only as complicated as it needs to be. Um, and so Bohr's model is good enough. It's not wrong. It's just not all the way right. And so in the setting of like a biology class, that's good enough to understand what you need to understand because this is chemistry, we can go deeper. But in a lot of settings, it's good enough to think of them as in, as in orbits, even though it's wrong. Go ahead, Marcos. Yeah, absolutely. You guys need more of this? Um, like that? Yep, okay. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, it's actually a lot like a TV screen. Um, so have you ever played with a black light? Um, and the reason black lights work is because there are these things called phosphors. Um, and it's actually some of the same stuff they put in computer and television screens. They glow when they get hit by something charged. Um, it's also why black lights work. So like if you, you know, you got a white t-shirt on, you go in a black light and it glows. The reason is because the detergents that we use to wash our clothes actually contain what are called phosphors. They're these little molecules that glow when they're hit with 
energy or charged things, um, and it makes our clothes look brighter and whiter. Um, but under ultraviolet light, they freak out and they glow. Well, that's all that screen was, was just a piece of plastic that had been coated with phosphors, and when these particles hit, it glowed. Yeah. You guys good? You are all feeling all right about this? So guys, again, you need to know the names, what they did, what they proved, the names of their models, and then you should understand some things about the cathode ray tube and the gold foil experiment. You guys good? All right. So guys, what we're going to do with the remainder of our day today is we are now going to dig into nuclear chemistry. So guys, to do this, we need to talk. Um, and we need, you don't need to write this down, but guys, we need to talk about the problem of the nucleus. So let me set the stage for you. Ernest Rutherford discovered the nucleus, right? Gold foil experiment. So what do scientists do when they make discoveries? The answer is they tell all their friends. And how do scientists talk to each other? They write papers. And so guys, after Rutherford discovered the nucleus, he wrote a paper telling the entire scientific community, hey guys, guess what? The atom has a nucleus, and inside that nucleus are all the protons. And guess what all of his friends said? You're an idiot. You are a stinking idiot. They actually just about kicked him out of the academic community when he proposed that an atom has a nucleus. See, guys, when we think about the atom having a nucleus, you got to understand that this is absolutely ridiculous. The question is why? Why did all the other scientists in his day think he was stupid to say that there was this thing called the nucleus that contained all the protons? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like in biology, cells have nuclei. And in that case, nuclei just means in the middle. Um, but why did they think he was nuts? Go ahead. I guess in May's about that, like, a lot of it's got a nucleus. Um, well, at least later with um, the work model. It's, okay. Uh, it denotes that most of it's space, which is kind of hard to conceptualize given mm -hmm. that we're very solid. Absolutely. But that wasn't what drove people to think Rutherford was nuts. Radical change in the model, right? But guys, there is something fundamentally stinking wrong with the nucleus. What's it made of? Protons. What's the charge of protons? Positive. What do like charges do to each other? They repel. Positively charged things don't want to clump together. What do they want to do? They want to get as far away from each other as they possibly can. So here's Rutherford going, hey guys, guess what? All the positive charges in an atom clump together in the middle. And everybody's going, guess what, stupid? Everybody knows that like charges don't attract, they repel, and there's no way that the nucleus can stay together. Do you see the problem? Guys, that's the fundamental problem with the nucleus. That as Rutherford is telling everybody that this thing called the nucleus exists, everybody's going, there's no stinking way that can be the case because the nucleus contains all positives and we all know that positives don't want to stick together, they want to fly apart. Does that, do you understand the problem? But guys, what did Rutherford do? Did he back down and go, gosh, you're right, I'm wrong. No, he held his ground. And he said, guys, I can't explain it, but I know that it's true. So guys, now we need to talk about the explanation. So if you don't understand what we're saying, guys, this is the problem. I just chose an atom. I chose potassium. This is how we've been drawing potassium atoms. Rutherford didn't even know, you don't need to draw this. Rutherford didn't even know about the neutrons. He just said, all the positives are together. And everybody said, you're an idiot, that can't be. Rutherford said, I know it can't be, but I also know it's true. And he stuck his ground. And later, as he thought about this more, he said, there has got to be a force that overcomes that repulsion and holds the nucleus together. And guys, it turned out later, Einstein proved him right. Do you know the name of the force? 
Let me give it to you, and you need to write this down. Guys, this is what is called the strong nuclear force. You may also hear it called the strong force. Yeah. There is also a weak force. So the weak nuclear force, do you understand that protons, neutrons, and electrons are not like Protons and neutrons are made of smaller things. They're actually made, oh, I took the poster down. They're made of quarks. And so the weak force is the force that holds the quarks together in the protons and neutrons, and then the strong force holds it all together. So guys, there is a force. You can think of it like gravity. There's like this special gravity that holds the nucleus together and it overcomes the repulsion of the protons against each other and it holds the nucleus together. So guys, here's the question. How strong does the force need to be in order to hold the nucleus together? Well, are you ready, guys? If you take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they're not quite sure how much, but this is about seven grams. Guys, if you can take seven grams, they, they, their best guess is this is how much. If you can take seven grams, not of steel, but if you can take seven grams of uranium and break the strong force in their nuclei, guess how much energy you get out? Enough to level the city of Hiroshima. Guys, when we drop that bomb on Hiroshima in an effort to end World War II, they're not exactly sure how much of the uranium in that bomb actually split and detonated. They think it's about seven grams. If you look it up online, you'll see estimates between like two grams and up to about 30 grams, but they're not sure. But if you could take, let's say, seven grams of uranium and break the strong force in that nucleus, that will release enough energy to level a city. You starting to get an idea of what it means to be strong? Guys, it is a crazy strong force that holds the nucleus together. Strong in ways that we don't even understand. And this is actually what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, great. So good for you. And we know this nucleus is crazy dense, right? What is it that allows it to stay that small and tight? And that's the strong nuclear force. That's a great way to think about it. That remember we said, what, 6.2 billion cars in that box? What is it that holds that matter together at that dense of a state? And it's the strong nuclear force. Yeah, good for you, Marcos. Go ahead. Uh, there's lots of ways. Um, so you can break it through what's called fusion. You can break it through fission, or you can break it through what's called radioactive decay. So don't write this down, but guys, that's exactly where we're going. How do we break the strong nuclear force? And guys, the answer is we can do this, and don't write this down, we can do this strongly through what are called high energy changes, or we can do it weakly through what are called low energy changes. So guys, let me give these to you. High energy changes are what are called fission and fusion. Low energy changes are what are called radioactive decay. And we're going to talk about three types, alpha, beta, and gamma. So guys, this is our outline for today. The question is, how do we break the strong nuclear force? Well, if we do it through fission and fusion, we get a pant load of energy. But we can also see the strong nuclear force breaking in lower energy ways, and that's called radioactive decay. And you're going to learn about three types, alpha, beta, and gamma. So guys, these are the five things we're going to talk about as we get into nuclear chem. You ready to go? So here we go. This is where you want to start taking notes. High energy changes. So guys, you already learned about one of these, fusion. Remember when we talked about nuclear or atomic evolution, we said Big Bang, stars, supernova, that's fusion. We're gonna start with fission. This is what is called nuclear fission. And guys, nuclear fission 
is the process of taking big nuclei and splitting it up into smaller nuclei. So fundamentally, what we're doing is taking big atoms and making them smaller. Not, is today Tuesday? Yeah, Thursday, Monday. Guys, Monday in class, you're going to see a fascinating video about how they first did this. The very first time we got a nuclear fission reaction to go was actually in a squash court. You know, squash is like kind of like racquetball. The first time we ever got a nuclear reaction to go was on a squash court in the Midwest. It was terrifying. They thought it might blow up. So guys, where do we see fission take place? And let me, where do we see fission take place just out in the natural world? Because the answer is we don't. Guys, fission is largely a man-made process. On a smaller scale, we see this in nuclear power plants, like the one they may build in Green River, Utah. But guys, on a grander scale, this is the reaction or the process that fuels a lot of our nuclear weapons. So guys, how does it work? Sam asked the question, how do we get this? To, how do we break the strong nuclear force? Well, guys, let me show you. It looks like this. This is actually the process that leveled Hiroshima um, in, in Japan. What we did is we took about, what's 20 times 2.2, about 45? We took about 45 pounds of uranium and we surrounded it with a bunch of dynamite. No, that's not true. We actually shot it. We shot, that's not true. We took two pieces of uranium and rammed them into each other. We'll learn more about that next week. And guys, when we did, this is actually what happens. That initial collision causes neutrons to get moving really, really fast. And if this neutron runs into a uranium nucleus, and guys, what is it that holds this uranium nucleus together? Strong nuclear force. This neutron acts like a wedge and it shoots through the uranium nucleus and busts it apart. And when that nucleus breaks apart, what is actually breaking? the strong nuclear force, and that releases energy. So this uranium nucleus breaks apart, it breaks into two smaller pieces, that releases energy. But guys, look at what else it releases. What are these? More neutrons. And where do those neutrons go? Well, they run into other nuclei, and those nuclei break, and then that releases more neutrons. And what do we call things that do this and just keep going? It's a chain reaction. You break one, that breaks three, that breaks nine, that breaks 27, and the next thing you know, so much energy is released that Hiroshima's gone. Exactly, because the problem is, is what if one of these neutrons doesn't run into your uranium nucleus and just flies off into space? Well, then that's one uranium nucleus that doesn't break apart. And so the trick is you've got to have so much uranium there. There's a name for it. It's called critical mass. You've got to have so much uranium there that the chances of a neutron hitting a nucleus are great enough that it'll keep the process going. And you can actually calculate what, cal what critical masses are for different elements. Um, I think for uranium, it's about 20 kilograms. Um, times 2.2 would give you pounds. So go ahead. And that's what it's doing. It's actually making krypton and barium atoms. And so when these break apart, it makes krypton and barium, and then it releases energy. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and actually that's where a lot of the energy comes as this happens, is these neutrons are moving at, I mean, 
closing in on the speed of light. They're cruising. So this reaction is almost instantaneous. Then if you've ever seen a nuclear reaction with the mushroom cloud, that energy as it expands gets transferred to the air that's surrounding the bomb. And it's actually the shock waves from the air and all of the heat that levels things. Um, you'll actually see in the video we watch on Tuesday, these waves of air just leveling buildings. It's unbelievable. Yeah, crazy. So guys, you understand this idea of the chain reaction? Let me show it to you this way then. Let's put it in motion. Nuclear fission is the splitting of a heavy element's nucleus to form two new elements with smaller nuclei. One of the most important fission reactions is that of uranium-235, which is used in nuclear reactors and atomic weapons. The fission of uranium-235 is initiated when a neutron traveling with enough velocity collides with the uranium-235 nucleus. The collision produces U-236, which immediately splits into two lighter elements, such as krypton-91 and barium-142. The fission event also releases three neutrons and energy. The three neutrons are capable of initiating more fission events if they encounter a uranium-235 nucleus. If a sufficient or critical mass of uranium-235 is present, the reaction becomes self-sustaining, resulting in the release of a massive amount of energy in the form of heat, light, and ionizing radiation, an atomic explosion. Get the idea? So now guys, let's go the other way. If fission breaks it apart, fusion puts it together. Guys, fusion is the nuclear process in which small nuclei fuse together to make heavier ones. Just a second. So guys, in this, we see this taking place in our sun and other stars. We've talked about this idea that hydrogen becomes helium. Helium becomes nitrogen, oxygen, carbon. Those fuse together up to iron, then supernova. More fusion breaks the iron barrier, goes to uranium. Guys, all of those are fusion processes as these particles are sticking together. Go ahead, Cam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do, um, but <clears throat> um, it's not a matter of density, it's a matter of stability. Krypton and barium are more stable nuclei, and as a result, they're less likely to fission. Um, so not all atoms can fission. Um, it takes a large, unstable nucleus for this to happen. And while probably a couple of those barium or krypton nuclei do break, it's not enough to sustain the reaction. It's really the uranium that breaks apart. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's actually not just uranium. It's uranium and anything heavier. Um, so actually, the bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima was uranium. Um, the bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki was plutonium. Um, so we tried both. And it's, it's fascinating how hard it was for us to get enough plutonium to make it work. Because plutonium, you can't dig up. It's man-made. And you'll see in this video we watched Tuesday, it's crazy. They built an entire city in order to just get enough plutonium to try to end the war. It was nuts. Yeah, and so now we're actually making what are called hydrogen bombs, right? And those aren't fission bombs, those are fusion bombs. Um, and we'll learn more, I know I keep saying this, in this video we're going to watch Tuesday, it'll talk about how fusion bombs work as well, because instead of them breaking atoms and releasing energy, now we're, it's, it's literally the reaction that takes place in the sun. Um, and so they're fusing hydrogen together. The thing that's crazy is to get that fusion to happen, they actually, a hydrogen bomb is a, is a canister of hydrogen wrapped in a fission bomb. And so the, initially the explosion is a fission bomb that then causes fusion in the hydrogen, and that's where you get all the additional energy. So, go ahead, Jerry. Correct.
Good question. And the answer is because when hydrogen fuses together to make helium, some um, mass is lost. Um, when hydrogen fuses, it loses some mass. And when it loses mass, that mass is converted to energy. Um, Einstein said E equals mc squared. And that energy is actually the energy of mass being converted to energy that creates all the additional energy in a hydrogen bomb. It's crazy. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, because uh, they, they have to be atoms that are either big and unstable or small and readily stuck together. That's why, that's why stars can only get to, to iron, because even huge, crazy hot things like stars can't get anything hotter or heavier than iron to fuse together. So no, and then it takes supernova. To, so maybe in theory, if you could build a supernova and put it in a bomb, but for practical reasons, no. Go ahead. What's that? Supernova or fusion, taking small atoms and putting them together. It doesn't, no. So the, the expansion that happens in a supernova is actually a star collapsing. And when it collapses, um, you get such a high concentration of energy that eventually it has to go somewhere and it goes out. They talk about the nucleus bouncing. And that's actually what happens is it collapses and then bounces. No, so a supernova releases everything heavier than iron because the star goes supernova when it's predominantly iron and then it collapses and bounces and releases all that additional energy that then gets iron to fuse. Is that okay? So guys, what does this fusion process look like? Kind of like this. So don't draw it, but literally what's happening in our sun is we've got hydrogen atoms that are fusing together into helium atoms. When it does, it releases some energy, and that's uh, the energy of the sun. But again, guys, you don't need just, you understand they're just fusing together. You guys good? Okay. So now, guys, what we're going to do is we are going to switch gears. And we are going to now talk about radioactive decay processes. So let me define it for you first. So guys, when we talk about decay, what we're talking about is atoms breaking down. So how does this work? Well, the way that this happens is some atomic nuclei are unstable. They don't have enough protons and enough neutrons for them to be stable and somewhat unchanging. And because of that, they go through what we call radioactive decay. Excuse me. Radioactive decay. What they're trying to do is they're trying to become stable. So guys, you don't need to draw this, but let me show you what I'm talking about. You okay? So guys, it looks like this. Let me zoom into this for you here. Don't worry about writing any of this down, but let me just show you what we're talking about. So this graph actually represents all of the elements on the periodic table. Now guys, this line over here is the number of protons. That's the atomic number. So this is hydrogen and this is lead. So it only goes up to element 82. So this line is the number of protons. This line is the number of neutrons. So guys, um, let me shut this off so I can touch it. This line right here represents an equal number of protons and neutrons. And guys, you may have noticed when you were filling out those charts in the last unit, did you notice that for the lighter elements, they tend to have the same number of protons and neutrons? Carbon is six protons, six neutrons. Nitrogen is seven and seven. Oxygen is eight and eight. Guys, for these lighter elements, they tend to like to have the same number of protons and neutrons. But then you'll notice these blue dots. And guys, these blue dots actually represent stable nuclei. So 
if we've got this many protons and 42 neutrons, that would be a stable nucleus. So these dots represent stable nuclei. And you'll notice what happens. Down here in the lighter elements, the stable nuclei have equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Then, as the elements get heavier and heavier and heavier, the line of stability goes away from the one-to-one -one ratio. What that means is the heavier the nucleus, the more neutrons they need to stick them together. And guys, this actually explains why some atoms are radioactive. This band right here is what we call the band of stability. And so inside that band, we have atoms that are fairly stable. Now, if you've got proton-neutron ratios that are outside that band, those will be your radioactive elements because they are actually trying to lose protons and lose neutrons to get in here into the band of stability. And once they get there, they're no longer radioactive. So if you're ever wondering why are some elements radioactive, the reason is because their proton-neutron ratio isn't in that band of stability, and they're trying to get there by dumping protons and neutrons in order to get into that band. Does that make sense? Okay, so guys, how do they do this? Well, there's three types of radioactivity, and you need to write down each one. So guys, you need to know about three types of radioactivity. The first one is what is called alpha decay. Just scratch this in your notes and then we'll play with it. Guys, this is what is called alpha decay. This is actually the Greek letter alpha. It's a little squiggly A looking guy. Or guys, notice the other way we represent alpha decay. Helium 4 over 2. Because guys, an alpha particle is actually a helium nucleus. flying out of the nucleus of an atom. So when an atom goes through alpha decay, it is actually ejecting a helium nucleus. So guys, what is a helium nucleus? Two protons and two neutrons. So guys, how do we know that it's two protons and two neutrons? Well, here's how. Check this out. Helium is element number two. That means two protons. Its mass is four. Four minus two is two neutrons. So when an atom goes through alpha decay, literally uh, two protons and two neutrons, a helium nucleus comes flying out of the atom. But guys, these helium nuclei are big and fat and slow. That's why Rutherford chose them as the particles to shoot at the gold foil. These are the same particles that Rutherford used in the gold foil experiment, and he picked them because they're so big and fat and slow that he knew that if they could get through, anything could get through. So guys, now I'm going to give you what's called a rule of thumb. Scratch it down, and then these are the last notes that you're going to take on this page. So what do we know? Alpha decay involves the release of a helium nucleus. We call them alpha particles. What are they made of? Two protons and two neutrons. And these things are big and fat and slow. And then I gave you what is called a rule of thumb, and I'll explain it in a minute. But guys, when something goes through alpha decay, Z goes down by two and A goes down by four. So guys, what I want to do is I want to explain to you what that rule of thumb means, and then I want to show you alpha decay. So guys, let's do this first. Here we go. Don't write this down. Just watch. So guys, you're going to see questions like this in the homework. Radium-226, what happens to it when it goes through alpha decay? Guys, please don't try to write this down. You're going to get distracted. Just watch. So guys, this is radium-226. Radium is element number 88. Its mass is 226. The question is this. What happens to it when it goes through 
alpha decay. So guys, this is the way we represent an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. So now let's draw some pictures. We're going to talk about the protons and neutrons in these things. So guys, how many protons is in radium 88? 88. And how many neutrons is in radium 88? We subtract, right? So 138. Is that okay? So now guys, let's talk about our alpha particle. What is an alpha particle made of? How many protons? Two. How many neutrons? Two. And that thing comes flying out of there at millions of miles an hour. And now we've got this alpha particle coming out of the radium. The question is this, what's left? So guys, if we started with 88 protons and if we left, lost two, how many are left? We've got 86 protons left, and if we started with 138 neutrons and lost two, how many are now left? 136. Now, guys, watch this. Is this element that's produced still radium? No, because radium is element number 88. This is now element 86, and element 86 is radon. So this is now a radon atom. But now, guys, what does it weigh? Well, 136 plus 86 is now 222. So guys, check this out. What happened to the atomic number at the bottom? Went down by how much? Two. What happened to the atomic mass on top? Went down by four. That is the rule. Oh gosh, sorry. That is, come on baby. That is the rule of thumb. So guys, when this happens, the atomic number went down by 2. From 88 to 86, the atomic mass went down by 4 from 226 to 222. You get it? Yeah. In my hand. So guys, this is a Geiger counter. If you guys don't understand the way a Geiger counter works, there's actually a gas-filled tube on the back of this thing, and when radioactive particles go through it, it causes a little bit of a charge that this thing senses and then beeps. So you'll notice that even right now, this is beeping a little bit, right? It's because every day of your life, you're being hit by radioactive particles. It's called background radiation, and our body has developed amazing ways of keeping it from hurting us. This is uranium. Guys, uranium is throwing off so many radioactive particles that this thing can't even beep fast enough to keep up. So if I hold it back here, you get a sense of it, right? So every time that thing beeps, it's being hit by a radioactive particle. Some of those are alpha particles. As I move it close enough, eventually it just can't beep fast enough, right? But now guys watch, that's really annoying. So now guys watch this. This is like full crazy exposure, right? But now listen. What changed? Now my hand is between the uranium and the beepy thing. So guys, when I put my hand between the uranium and the Geiger counter, what happens to the rate at which it beeps? Slows down. Why does it slow down? because some things aren't able to get through my hand. When I do this, my hand's not in the way. But when I do this, some things don't get through my hand and therefore don't hit the detector. And guess what's true of those things that don't get through? They're big and slow. Those are the alpha particles. Guys, alpha particles aren't able to go through your flesh. So right now, my hand is filling up with alpha particles, and they get into my hand, and they can't go through. But guys, is something still getting through? And what must be true of the something that's still getting through? Smaller and faster, right? And guys, that smaller, faster stuff are called beta particles. So now let's talk about beta particles. Guys, beta particles are abbreviated squiggly B, which is the Greek letter beta, or check this out. Uh-oh, what's that? What's that dude right there? That's an electron, right? But guys, remember, electrons, don't we do it like this? And you'll notice that we did this different. The negative one is in front. 
So guys, beta particles are electrons, but they are crazy electrons. Ready for this? You're not going to like this. What is a beta particle? A beta particle is an electron that comes out of the nucleus. Wait, I thought the nucleus only contained protons and neutrons. Yep. But guess what? A beta particle is an electron that comes out of the nucleus. And it comes out of the nucleus when a neutron becomes a proton. Wait, back the truck up. Guys, this literally happens. Neutrons can magically become protons. And when they do, electrons come flying out of the nucleus. And these electrons that come flying out are small, high energy particles. So guys, the rule of thumb for this, when this happens, Z goes up by one, and A stays the same. So guys, let me show you what we're talking about. Once you're done with this, you're done taking notes. You ready to go? So guys, the question that I'm going to look at that I don't want you to write down is this. What happens to iodine-127 when it undergoes beta decay? So guys, it looks like this. Here's iodine-127. When it does this and goes through beta decay, what happens to it? Again, don't write this down. So guys, let's look at the nuclei. So iodine-53 is 53 protons, subtract 74 neutrons. Good? So guys, what is a beta particle? It's an electron. It's not protons or neutrons. It's an electron. But when this electron comes out, what happens to one of these neutrons? It becomes a proton. So the number of neutrons goes down by 1 to 73. The number of protons goes up by 1 to 54. So this is now element 54. And element 54 is not iodine anymore, it is xenon. But guys, what happens when we add up these numbers? 7 and 7 and 5, it's still 127. So guys, the mass doesn't change, but the atomic number goes up by 1. That's called beta decay. So now guys, let's do this one more time. Ready? Okay, so full exposure. Why is it beeping more slowly? Where are the alpha particles? In my hand, what's getting through? Beta particles. Is there anything we can do to keep the beta particles from getting through? Yes. A sheet of lead. How can I do this so you can see? I'll do this. Okay, so guys, full exposure. Alpha particles are in my hand, beta are getting through. Can we stop the beta? Lead. And when we put the lead screen in the middle, you'll notice that it slows down because the beta are now in the lead. But it's something still getting through. Yeah, yeah. And what exactly in that stuff is even smaller and even faster. And guys, that's super small, faster. What are we called? Gamma decay. Now you ready? Are you ready for this? This crazy. is crazy. Guys, guys, the gamma decay is so small, small it isn't, it isn't a even a particle. It's just, it's just energy. energy. It's not, it's not even a thing. thing. It's, it's energy. energy. Gamma rays gamma are not particles, particles. They're energy. energy. That's, That's where it comes from. Gamma rays. Gamma rays. Guys, these guys, are just these are high energy, energy waves, waves similar, similar to light. light. And, they, and don't they don't change, change the, atomic the atomic number or the atomic, or the atomic mass. mass. They are, they are oh gosh, sorry. They don't, they don't change, change the atomic, atomic number, number or the atomic, atomic mass. mass. And they go through, as you saw, they go through lead. If you stack up, what you'll see in the second, 
second. What you'll see in the second video that we watch on Thursday, you can actually stop the gamma rays, but it takes about three feet of concrete to do it. Okay, so guys, don't go yet. Here's the question. What have you got to be able to do with this? Don't write this down, but watch. Guys, this is what your homework is going to look like. Let me step you through this. The bell's going to ring in a minute. I'm going to finish doing this. You've already got your homework in your possession. If you need to leave, that's fine. I'm going to keep teaching. And you can watch the screencast if you need to catch this. But guys, watch. Don't go yet. I still got you for a minute. Here's the way this goes. So guys, you are being asked to identify the type of decay and then the product that's produced. So guys, notice what's happening. The atomic number is going up by one and the mass is staying the same. Is that alpha or beta? That's beta decay. And when that happens, this is how we represent a beta particle. Now here, the atomic number is going down by two and the mass is going down by four. What's that? Alpha decay. And this is how we represent an alpha particle. Now guys, what about this? What's this? Is this alpha or beta? This is an alpha particle, but now, guys, we're being asked to predict the product. So the atomic number will go down by two, the atomic mass will go down by four, and that is now thallium, our new product. Now, guys, understand you're also going to see problems like this, where you're given the element and the type of decay. So this is radon-222. And the question is, what happens if it goes through alpha decay? You'll predict the products. If you need to go, that's fine. I'm going to wrap this up. You're welcome to go. Check the screencast. Homework due on Thursday, you guys. So as this goes through alpha decay, the atomic number goes down by 2. The mass goes down by 4. And this is no longer radon. It's element 84 polonium. In beta decay, with bismuth 214, if it goes through beta decay, the mass stays the same, the atomic number goes up by one, and this is now polonium. So guys, check the screencast, make sure you know how to do this. The homework is long. We'll see you Thursday, or we'll see you today for remediation.